he says, Jesus came to do three days work and that's the gospel. That's well, it, it isn't. It, yeah, it's almost as if all he needs to do is to parachute down from heaven, literally straight That's onto right. the cross, to do what had to be done and be resurrected. And, and that is all. So the whole ministry was kind of a bit of a, well, a prelude, I guess, to the real matter. Well, well I love that. I'm, I'm going to steal that line from you right away. I'll give you credit for it. But parachute down. Yeah. I love that. Well, I'm not sure it's, it might be slightly irreverent, actually. So I'm not sure I'd be t totally happy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can see some people might see that as being a bit um, irreverent, but uh, it might be. I don't mean yes. it in irreverent way. I just mean it in a, in the sense of the soteriology. It, it just it, uh, it's encapsulated in this idea of suddenly appearing on the cross, doing yes, it, and then yes, follows, and that would well, seem to be. That's right. um, Who are you by profession, if I might? Are, are you a pastor, so called? No, no, American no, no, I, I'm, um, I just have a simple office job. I don't. I, I'm not as. I don't have any. Yeah. Um, ministry at all but i'm very interested in comparative religion or always have been particularly Wonderful. the abrahamic faith uh, obviously of judaism really and islam yes you are you are a muslim officially or not um not officially <laughs> okay not officially okay. Uh, un un unofficially um i i do accept that but um yes i, I did study theology at heathrop uh, part of london university um you, you did your new testament greek at birkbeck i hear was that right no i did my new testament greek at london university but but, but london university is part well but birkbeck is is a college within okay. the university of london it's a federal i've forgotten system. that yeah yeah so um heathrow yes. which, uh, which is now no longer it, it disappeared a couple of years ago it was uh, also a college as part of this federal system university of london where okay specialized in theology and philosophy alone and that's all they did it was a jesuit college originally oh really um but it it uh, anyway it, it it actually uh closed a couple of years ago due to funding issues and whatnot but but right. still going strong but excuse good. me uh yes. excuse me paul yes i forgot to ask how long are you planning to go go oh i see no i'm um, certainly no more than a, a, an hour i mean this is not a, a major ordeal it's just a friendly conversation um no problem thank you <laughs> thank you no, for we appreciate that um thank you for asking that um hmm. so um can i yes, just sir. can i just uh, just jump in the deep end so to speak if of i of course may. absolutely uh, and, um and um I, I i just to say i'm not a trinitarian myself so in what i'm about mm -hmm. to say i'm not defending trinitarianism but i think that there is um a point I wanted just to share with you. And for example, in uh, this book uh, Ray, by Raymond E. Brown, I'm sure you know he was- I know it well, yes. Yes, uh, Introduction mm. to New Testament Christology. I yes. actually heard him lecture uh, when I was an undergraduate, but we, we went to Oxford University and he came to, from the States. Really? And gave a lecture on patristics. And um, so I actually saw him uh, at Oxford. Yes. But anyway, in this marvelous book- um, Yes towards the end he says some interesting things i just wanted to run them by if i may absolutely thank you he says in the past he he looks at a variety of passages which uh where jesus is either um he says passage <laughs> where the title where the use of the title god for jesus is dubious yeah and he mentioned some of those because of textual variants and whatnot yeah. passages that seem to imply that the title god was not used of Jesus, but the passage, the, the section here is where he says passages where Jesus is clearly called God in his yes. view. And obviously, you know the passages very well. The first one he references is he, the letter to the Hebrews, chapter one, verse eight and nine, yes. where uh, the writer, whoever he is, it, as he quotes in Psalm 45, your throne yes. o God, is forever and ever. Um, and and uh, I mean, it, it, he seems to have a point and yeah, I know in Psalm 45, the word God is used of the king, perhaps in a coronation yeah. situation. And it's not seriously at all entertained that that person, the king figure, is actually Yahweh. Uh, and yeah. and but the author of the Hebrews is using this passage to apply to Jesus. Would you say that in a similar way, he's also using this passage in a, in a, as a t in a titular sense or a metaphorical sense or do you think yeah. the hebrew is meaning us in a slightly more literal sense where he is actually proposing yeah. jesus is god in some way well i think the nab the catholic bible does beautifully with that i think maybe in an older version but they simply put a little g on the first one there right. your throne oh god and they explain in a note that this is a messianic use of the word god so firstly i don't think this is used of any king i have no evidence for that i find it used of jesus 
it might have been used of another kind. I don't, I don't get into that. I don't have any evidence for that. So Jesus is certainly called God. And then immediately the writer says, therefore, God, who is your God. Yeah, so yeah, that, yeah. you know, settles all issues right away that we're yeah. not saying that Jesus is God, which would break the first command, which is absurd for a Jew. We're simply saying he's God in a messianic sense there, I think. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a, a fair point. And I think your point about then the, the person who's being addressed as God then yeah. has a God, uh, which that's it. relativizes the first use of it to a, a metaphorical or a titular sense. A Absolutely. Messiah, a Messiah figure, which there are other examples in the scriptures, yeah. you know. So that makes sense. Okay, that, that, that's a, a, yeah. a, like that. I'll say <laughs> the next example, if I, if I may just add yes, of course. two more. And, mm. you, you know, you could probably answer these in your sleep. So um, is... <laughs> Um, is we all do something. We do this as a job, you know, all day long. So it's no, it's no big deal. You, okay. We all do something. <laughs> True. He's very gracious. Uh, uh, in, the inevitable one then is John one one. In the beginning, yes. the, the word was with God. Uh, the word was God. Now uh, Brown does admit that this is uh, an incredibly, uh, you know, he, he refers to the complexities of interpretation here and the, yeah. uh, the uh, whether. Uh, so else has the definite article or not in, in one place it yes but it doesn't have them and what's the significance of that in terms of interpretation of the passage he yeah. does he does come down ultimately on the side that john is um the author is calling jesus god in a more literal sense yes um, and i'm not going to yeah. go into the grammatical arguments but well, what yeah. is your what is your interpretation of well first of all i owe a lot to raymond brown marvelous catholic scholar i mean i loved what he did with the birth narrative that's the book that i use a lot yeah and he's very honest he talks about lyonnais a french theologian who was very embarrassed by some verse i've forgotten what it was because it clearly was totally non-trinitarian so first of all <laughs> raymond brown is a blessing to me i'm not against him but John 1.1 1, 1 is not so hard. What in the world are you doing putting a capital on that word? When you've got the word logos and davar in Hebrew, you've got it thousands and thousands of times. And you suddenly arrive at John 1.1 1, 1 and you put a capital on that's illogical to me. So what if it's the word? What is word? It's God speaking. We often have a verbal thing in the Old Testament. God said becomes a noun thing in the new. That's very typical. So God said, let there be light. That's God's word. But the word, as I'm sure you understand, is essentially the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. That's what we're losing. We exist to try to get the gospel of the kingdom back. So in the beginning was God's self-expression. Mm -hmm. Why not? And that word was an it. It wasn't a he. Mm -hmm. All things are made through that, with that in mind. That right. verbal idea, let's say in the beginning was the idea. Right. Everything came into existence with that idea. That was his plan. And then that word became embodied uniquely mm -hmm. in a human being. So the word was God. John uses nouns adjectively very often. God is light. God is love. <clears throat> and God is spirit, right? Meaning God is spiritual, really. Mm -hmm. So God is, wor the word is Godish. That's what it is. It's not another person. In fact, some translations, I'll finish with this, say um, the word was God himself. I like that. Mm -hmm. The word was God himself in his self-expression. So what Goppelt is the best theologian here. He says Jesus is what the word became, not one to one equal with the pre-existing word. Mm. We got it. No, I, that, that, that's a very good point. So in a sense, like uh, what some Christians have done is they reified and personified what is, what, is, what is a the logos is the speech of god the utterance of god and they made I think so. a separate person yes and, uh, a dyadic uh formula moving into a triadic formula absolutely right yeah that's interesting i no. think that's beautiful i got this from the christadelphians i briefly tell you in in the 1980s i came through the armstrong movement where we kept the sabbath the new pagans were meeting on sunday mm -hmm. i blush to say that now because into my ignorance as a C V boy Mm. And I'll blame the clergy to some extent, but myself, I wasn't paying attention. I didn't know anything about the Bible. We didn't do Bible. That was an American thing. Yeah. I've since 60 years now I've done the Bible. And I know something about that because you're bound to learn something about what you do all day long. Yeah. So I was getting that from the Christadelphians. They said the rock that followed them was not literally Jesus. I said, come on, where's your literal understanding? So I argued with them for about two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. and then I said, my goodness. Paul said they were baptized into the Red Sea. Oh, mm. typically. Paul actually says typikos, and we're using the modern Greek pronunciation okay. because yeah. it's beautiful. And I got it. And they were doing the same stuff at Cambridge, my 
notorious cousin John A.C. Robinson um, was hey, doing your, all of your, that. Sorry, he's your cousin. Yeah, absolutely, my mother's first cousin. Oh my God, I, I had no idea you were related yeah. to the because oh, he yeah. was he was both a, a, a very uh, a, a celebrated uh, biblical yes. scholar and a bishop of Woolwich. Was it Bishop of Woolwich? Totally. Uh, who, who, Absolutely. Who, the honest, who who was a bit of a um, I don't know, a bit of a scandal in his day in the sixties with his uh, uh, Lady and, Chatterley. Uh, yeah, and his views are on God uh, and um, <laughs> theology. Was was he kind of trying to popularize Rudolf Bultmann? Was he to some extent? In, in well, terms? yeah. Uh, very simply, John A. T. From my angle, got the Unitarian thing absolutely right. Human face of God. Yes. And his Gospel of John. It's brilliant stuff. They were brilliant kids. I'll say that for them. Yeah. They all had first-class degrees from Cambridge in mathematics and theology. So they they were bright kids, and so my mother <laughs> sold me on her first cousin a lot. So I was getting this Unitarian stuff really from Cambridge, from Caird and Robinson. Oh, G.B. Caird, so, oh, who, who of yeah. course was the mentor of uh, Tom Wright. Uh, who's Absolutely. Kind of, he spends a lot of time in your country uh, these days. When I say your country, I mean America. Isn't that amazing? So it that and the Christadelphians from a purely biblical point of view and J.A.T. in the whole discussion of the Honest to God discussion, this is beautiful stuff to me. I cannot believe that Jesus was ever as complicated as the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, I, you know, I, if he is, he just kept it quiet. You'd think he'd make himself a bit clearer <laughs> in the Gospels if that was. But um, just the, 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 uh, the yep. final one then from um, yes, one of the clear uh, pieces yes. of evidence according to uh, uh, um, Raymond E. Brown. Yes, notable passage John twenty twenty eight. Uh, yes. Where Thomas confesses him as my Lord and my God. And, and, and uh, yeah. he says, this is the clearest example in the New Testament of the use of God for Jesus. Here, Jesus is addressed yes. as God, a nominative form with a definite article which functions as a vocative. In other words, yes, my Lord addressing him. Uh, yeah. And this scene just, uh, is designed to serve as a climax to the gospel. Um, yes. So uh, and he makes an interesting point, which I hadn't taken on board. It may well be that the Christian use of such a confessional formula was catalyzed by the Roman emperor Domitian's claim to the title Lord and God, Dominus and Deus, not yes. So I've actually come across this idea uh, in some uh, Harvard scholars who said the same thing. So John is saying, no, Jesus yeah. is our Lord and yes. God, not Caesar. But of course, then yeah. the catch is, it occurred to me, the ca which, which Rembrandt didn't pick up on, the catch is that no one thought Domitian was Zeus or Jupiter, the Lord <laughs> God of the universe. Everyone understood that he was a guy, however, um, you know, a, a blessed yeah. by God or chosen by God. That's so right. In a sense, it, um, Brown's point kind of backfires if you take it a little bit further, I think. Yes, he was very honest. Let me tell you something about Roman Catholics that I've experienced. I've I have corresponded with a lot of top people. Dad taught me if in any field you want to go to the top people, and I would continue to say the people at, at Yale and Harvard, Oxford and Cambridge, although they are not, often unbelievers from my naive point of view. Yeah, yeah. They technically tend to be right. The BDB lexicon, Brown Driver and Briggs lexicon is not mostly wrong. Mm. So you go to the top people in the field and God has brought into our path, and I do see a, a divine thing here, top people in their field like Richard Hires from, uh, from Florida, I don't know if you know him, Jesus and eschatology he wrote, very good on our kingdom point, which we only make one point about the kingdom. So I've learned everything from Raymond Brown. He's the one who says of Luke 135 there, this is precisely why he's the son of God. I've got the Greek in my head, the okay. We live out of this. Yeah, yeah. You don't need another reason, it's precisely. So yeah. I'll say to my Trinitarian friends, okay, start with Matthew, Mark and Luke, show me the Trinity there. Mm. They can't do it. No, I, I agree, but th this passage in, in John uh, yes. is Raymond Brown's uh, key text that he says Absolutely. That Jesus is God. So, so when yep. Thomas is saying this in the vocative, yes. in addressing uh, him, Absolutely. Uh, how would you counter that to yep. someone who says, well, clearly he is God for John, yes. uh, but you deny yeah. that he is God. So what, what, how do you... Well, I, absolutely. Keep me to the point. Absolutely. First of all, the, the point of John's gospel is not actually that verse. The point is that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. So that's his final, that should be an um, umbrella, shouldn't it, over everything. Yeah. But this, the object of saying to Jesus, my Lord, my God, is simply that in the chapter 14, Jesus said, have I been with you so long and you don't see that if you're seeing me, you're seeing God? Well, he finally got it. 
Then he says, oh, my Lord. Now, Lord, though, and this is my other major point, is the Lord Messiah. Mm. Mm. Psalm 1 is what we want to do for the rest of our careers. Mm. That second Lord there, people find this a little technical. It's not at all. Uh, I, Adoni I, is my Lord Messiah. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you start there, everything is clear. And of course, now I see God in you. That's exactly what you didn't see in chapter 14. So that's the way I would attempt to deal with that. Right. So Otherwise, it contradicts everything else. Right. That's the point. So you're saying, yes, once you take his other verse into account, yes. it kind of modifies an otherwise uh, fairly black and white statement of deity attributed to Jesus. Yes. So saying, no, it's, yes. He's God in the sense that is compatible with those other verses which modify this and give it a... That's sign. right. I see. No, that, that's... a. Uh, that's a fair point. I, I, I mean, I, yeah. I, as I, say, I don't believe the historical Jesus was, was uh, believed himself to be God. So I'm sympathetic to your. Yes. Um, wants to know what, how you yourself. Yes. What methodology you. Well, I would always use, as you as you just mentioned, the balance of other verses. First of all, in John's gospel is written so that you may believe that Jesus is God. No, no, no. That's just absurd. No, I'm sorry to be dismissive. You know, I shouldn't be dismissive. But I really think one day the world is going to fall on its knees and weep and say how stupid we were. Mm -hmm. And I was in the Church of England. Mm -hmm. We despised things that were biblical as being American. Well, America has been very good to us. I went back to school here, you see, and got my degree. So in America, and the freedom has been tremendous. This is a beautiful place to be oh, from right. a religious point of view. So certainly in 14, the point, the problem was he didn't see. If you've seen me, you've seen God. You've heard me, you've heard God. I get it. He finally said, my Lord, Messiah. Yeah. And my God, I get it. But John 17, 3 still remains there, I hope, and I'm sure pounding in your heart too, mm -hmm. that you, Father, are, are monos, alithinos, theos. You're the only one yes, yes, who is yes. true God. Tell that to your child of two. Yeah, yeah. No, I, okay, so you qualify it with that. that that's fair enough. Uh, yes. I, that's a fair methodology. Yes. Well, thank you for that. If, if I could just shift. If, of course, uh, absolutely. The, the discussion to something mm. um, uh, that, that I find absolutely fascinating, it's soteriology. Yes. Um, yes. In other words, the understanding of salvation and how one, uh, what that means and how one attains it and what did Jesus teach and what do yes. later Christians teach. And I, I, I'm uh, uh, the gospel of Jesus, yes. uh, uh, which is the gospel of the kingdom, as you so rightly say, in the synoptics particularly, because that's where the kingdom of God seems to be in those terms vocalized more than-, than Absolutely. Um, um, you, you get a passage, for example, uh, which you will know, of course, in John, in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, a man comes up to Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to mm. inherit eternal life? Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God alone. And then he says, obey the commandments. He lists five of them. Uh, the young man says, I've obeyed all these since I was a youth. Jesus looked at him and loves you. You lack one thing. Yes. Go sell all you, you know, give your money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Yes. Uh, the man, of course, in this story uh went away because he had lots of possessions but yep. nevertheless the message is clear even though yep. the the guy didn't uh uh run with the message so to speak yes so my point is that it, um i understand what i think i understand what that passage is saying but what mm. i don't understand and and and, uh, mm. and this is for all kinds of christians not just trinitarians unitarians absolutely and stuff, is if this is a genuine message from jesus about how to inherit eternal life mm -hmm. Why does that message differ, it seems to me, so radically from that taught by Paul, who, when yeah. asked the same question in Acts, for example, um, said to the jailer at Philippi, believe on the Lord Jesus yes. uh, and you will be saved, which seems to be a, a rather different message. And I'm wondering how you integrate <laughs> reconcile yeah. the two. Well, first of all, your King James then caught up with you believe that you don't believe on anybody today so mm -hmm. that gives you a way you're reading king james that's fine you, you love it but believe on first of all speak to me in english believe in the lord jesus that's exactly the same as what jesus said i see no difference at all if you believe in jesus you're yeah. going to do his teaching so we've come in the last six months particularly and we do feel the lord leaves leads us in in, in gentle ways I'm not coming, trying to come over as some super charismatic. I, I despise a lot of what's done in that name. Mm. But I think the bottom line is this, 1 Timothy 6, 3 and 2 John 7 to 9 say, if somebody comes to you and doesn't bring the teaching of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, watch out. Big scam. Mm -hmm. So I'm concentrating. And, and you, when, you, when you told me earlier, you know, I got it in your letter here about the teaching of Jesus, yes. gospel of Jesus, that subjective objective genitive is absolutely key 
Yeah, so we're back to Mark chapter one, the beginning, the achi, the beginning. I mustn't get too excited because you, you're, you're switching me on here. But the beginning, <laughs> no, I mean, I find this so fascinating. I don't know why I, I, I do, but I do. The beginning of the gospel. Nobody starts there. Billy Graham doesn't start there. Why do you always have to rush to Paul? Why don't you get Jesus under your belt before you start with Paul? I don't think they contradict at all. So the beginning, the achi of the gospel of Jesus, why doesn't every preacher in the land, and I look at them daily, offering salvation, not one of them starts there. That's an ongoing question for me. So start there, the beginning of the gospel, and it's called God's gospel, yes, which you find eight times in the New Testament. Wonderful umbrella, right? You've got it in, in all over the epistles and also in the gospel. It's God's gospel. It doesn't get any better than that. This is God's message of salvation. Mm -hmm. And he begins with a command. You talked about obeying Jesus in the passage you read out. So how about obeying Jesus here? Repent, that's a command, and stop not believing in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that's the Adam thing in reverse. Adam lost his, his uh, stable position by not taking seriously his lordship over the world that God was going to give him. Mm -hmm. So the reverse of that is to stop being like Adam, be like Jesus, who takes the kingdom of God as the center of everything he has. Yeah, that's, that's very good. So I, I hope I haven't got carried away there, no, but that's, no, that's I, how I see it. I, I like your correction of uh, my King James, which, <laughs> which, <laughs> being an Englishman, of course, just slipped in unconsciously. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, um, I'm not a million miles from Hampton Court, of course, where yeah. the Bible was uh, translated uh, here in London. But uh, I'll just read from the, uh, <laughs> the NRSV, uh, which yes. uh, is slightly more modern. Um, uh, Acts 16. Um, yep. You know the story about Paul and Silas. Uh, yes, I do. The jailer said, um, sirs, yes. what must I do to be saved? They of are course. to believe on the Lord Jesus. Yes as you correctly say, and you will be <laughs> saved, you and your household. Of now, that, 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 that is, now, the earlier text in Mark, or the later text, because, of course, the written yes. later than Paul, yeah. um, yep. uh, the man comes to Jesus, what must I do to inherit yeah. eternal life? Mm. I assume the phrasing, although it's different, are actually uh, saying the same thing. Oh, yes. Different kinds of, they are saying in just different forms. Yes. Words. What I have to and do. said to him, after you know you know the commandments yes um now the parallel passage in matthew 19 uh verse 16 has a has a slightly more um jewish feel to it then someone yes. came to Jesus and says teacher what good deed must i do to have eternal life right Jesus says if you wish to enter into life keep the commandments now this is a very jewish answer uh, oh, the, the commandments yeah. of god the ten commandments the 630 commandments of the law yeah. But so I, I do come back. I, I, I don't find you, your answer a hundred, yeah, hundred percent persuasive. In that yeah. I, I don't think that they these two answers, by which I mean the one in Paul, yep. uh, the one in yep. the synoptics, yep. are yep. the same in substance. So I, I I get the sense okay. that one is is the gospel of Jesus, focusing on following the Jewish law. In other words, be a right. good Jew. The other one is focusing on believing on the. Messiah, uh, as as you rightly said, which is not in the Messiah. Same. Yeah, in it the Messiah. Messiah. I mean, yeah, believing in that, of course, it is yeah. not quite the same thing. Um, or, or okay, or maybe could you um, perhaps explain? Well, yeah, absolutely. That's why we live out of the eight kingdom texts in guess where the Book of Acts. What I'm trying to do is to reattach Paul to Jesus. Yes, indeed. Which is really not to cut the Bible in half. I see that. So I would argue from the eight kingdom texts in Acts. Mm -hmm. that the kingdom of God gospel is just as central there as it was in the in the words of Jesus. No difference. So I'm up against dispensationalism of VP Weirwell and Bullinger and where they and people don't believe it's when I quote it. I can quote from their books. They say the gospel of the kingdom is not for you. That's for Jews. That to me is pure antichrist. If you want to get lost, you adopt that kind of thing because it does away with Jesus. It puts the new covenant. Said that. I didn't know these people said that. that, that's, that oh, they do. Quite Even you are shocked. Even you are shocked by I mean, that. I am very shocked because these are the Gospels we're talking about. We're not talking of, the, oh, we don't follow what Jesus teaches in the Gospels. Oh, no, no. What? And you call yourself a disciple of Jesus? Um, well, it's just nonsense. But this is where we're at, at the level of miseducation. Mm. Dispensationalism, particularly the ultra form, says that really the late letters of Paul alone are, what's the word, normative for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I say that is pure antichrist. 
See, what I'm troubled by is the statement where Jesus said, when I come back, will I find the faith on the earth? Maybe not. Mm-hmm. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Few find it. Multitudes, in my translation, multitudes will say to me, look what we did. Preach mm-hmm. in your name, miracles. Get out of here. What? Mm-hmm. I'm the son of an admiral, so we were supposed to do what we were told. I get that. But that's pretty harsh, isn't it? Mm. So I'm sitting here thinking, what can I do for the public to try to get them not to fall into that terrible trap? First is to go back to back to Mark 1 mm. and repent and stop not believing in the gospel of the king. Because that's your destiny. So we're against the heaven going thing. Billy Graham's books are full of heaven and heaven and heaven and heaven. I read yeah, these things all yeah. the time. Yeah, it doesn't sound to me like what you call the Jewish Jesus. No. Jesus is a Jew, a Jew, a Jew. Absolutely he's a Jew. Uh, I think there's a, a your point. Uh, uh, Billy Graham, yeah. um, yep. of course, is is now passed away. But uh, yes. I, I, I think he, he he was characteristic of a certain kind of American evangelical theology yes. with this emphasis on heaven, 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 and hell, as you say. That's right. But that, right. I, I take your point. That wasn't really quite how Jesus uh, ex- expressed. It doesn't sound like Jesus. If you want to be a Christian, why not sound like Jesus? Yeah. So here's the other major point. We've tended to reduce religion to ethics. Mm. what I call the jolly good chap theology. That's where I was born. <laughs> no, everybody, will, and many of them were. I'm, I'm going to nick that day, excuse me. So I'm going to nick that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jolly good chap theology is everybody is basically a good chap. Mm. So why wouldn't God want them in heaven is, is the argument. And I find that very disastrous because Jesus is very tough. So I'm trying to say, how could that awful situation arise where you say, Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Ah, I get it. No good calling me Lord. No good doing as uh, Billy Graham's son does beautifully in some sense, and yet I think deceptively. Come to Jesus. Won't you come to him? Give him your heart. What mm. does all that mean? Mm. It, it's too vague. And I do believe in the devil. I'm not a Christadelphian. I've debated them recently. On that point. No, it's a sentimentalized religion. Um, and Good word. Uh, I agree. Just coming back to your yes. uh, uh, mention, the beginning of Mark's gospel. Yes, uh, yes. The beginning of uh, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, and it just reminded me in that very paragraph, again, looking at the NRS. Uh, yes. D, Good um, translation. Yes, good one. Well, because I'm not using a gift from Zoom. Sorry, uh, running out of time. We've removed the 40 minute time limit on your group meeting. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was about to tell me that I didn't have any more time and I was about to be jettisoned into <laughs> darkness. Um, no, that, that, very, <laughs> that very passage uh, from verse four, uh, yes. to me, introduces another theme here, which again, I think, sits uneasily with uh, normative Christianity. It says, John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism, as you know, of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. People from all over Judea and so on came to him, were baptized by him in the river Jordan for the forgiveness of their sins, uh, confessing their sins. And it talks about he was dressed in camel's hair and whatnot. I'm not interested in the clothing side of things, but it's... it's, it's, what, what, what strikes me is so yeah. interesting there from the position of soteri- from the soteriological uh, yeah. standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to me that people that John went, uh, uh, appeared proclaiming a, a baptism, uh, which, of course, is a Jewish um, yes. Jewish patriot rewrite. We see that in the Absolutely. Dead, uh, in the Qumran community. They have their, yeah. their baths. Even today, Jews still have this bath uh, in synagogues everywhere. They still have these yep. uh, things. Yep. You don't call it baptism it's called something else in hebrew yes mikveh um, or something mikveh. Exactly. Mm-hmm. but um but the, this baptism um mm. was uh symbolized in that sense a repentance uh for the forgiveness of sins yes i always ask christians um were their sins forgiven now it sounds like an obvious question of course their sins are forgiven because it says it yes. was a baptism of forgiveness of sins. yeah but i've noticed whenever i ask that they usually get what i they usually think why is he asking this question because <laughs> if you ask that question and the question is yes, and then what was the point of Jesus' death on the cross? Because people <laughs> were already forgiven in the ministry of John the Baptist through water baptism. So yes. it, it leads me asking, what was the whole yes. point of the rest of the gospel if that baptism yes. is efficacious in forgiveness of sins? And I'm just wondering that's what fascinating. You're... Well, that's fascinating because what we've again in the last year become very very conscious of in view of dispensationalism, which we're against is that John the Baptist is the beginning of the new covenant, Luke 16, 16. It says that the law and the prophets were until John. 
from that time on, the kingdom of God is being preached. That's exactly the same message as Jesus. So they have the same message, kingdom of heaven in Matthew. Don't ever, of course, you aren't, are very well instructed. You would never make the mistake of saying the kingdom of heaven is one gospel and the kingdom of God is something else. I mean, that's just so bad. But people do it regularly in America. But um, they're both preaching the same gospel. But that simply means you have to obey that. In order to be forgiven, though, you've got to say, all right, I'm, if I'm going to repent, I'm going to have to do something different. Well, we need the cross, don't we, to cover all of our sins, past, present, and future. But we start by obeying that first commandment. But what, what, why is the cross necessary then, given that sins were forgiven within the context yes. of Judaism through this symbolic rite of cleansing, repentance yep. it, it was a, it says a, a proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins that's right it, it seems to me if this yep. was efficacious if it was mm. bad if it happened then it seems to undermine this sense that paul, paul teaches about that a a, a further yep. crucifixion of the messiah was required for sins to be forgiven because they'd already yep. been forgiven through john the baptist's ministry yep. It seems to me to be a, a tension there yep. between the two. I think that's a great question. And I think the answer is this, that the new covenant is in process. We're dealing with ex-way people, ex-way international people who are quite convinced that Jesus had to keep the law and the letter. That's false. Jesus right. is the minister of the new covenant. So at this stage in the story, I can understand that. That's what they needed was a sense of being forgiven. We haven't got to the cross yet. We haven't taught about the cross. In fact, only in Matthew 16, 21, he begins, that key word, he begins to tell about his death. So I think the answer to your question, it's a very good one, but we need to talk about that on our own programs a lot. I don't think they're ready yet for the crucifixion story from Isaiah 53. So mm -hmm. you need to be forgiven. And so the best they can do, not that John the Baptist repentance is right now, you know, in Acts 19, mm -hmm. he met people who had, only the baptism of John. Okay, yes. let's get you baptized. Yeah. <laughs> so that baptism, I'm actually so glad you asked that question. I love that question. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a, a, a calendrical thing. It's a time thing. And people don't think in good sequences. They want to know, well, Jesus said this here. That's it. Wait a minute. The law was given by Moses. Grace and truth were progressively unveiled by Jesus for me. So I think, and I hadn't thought of it quite this way until you asked the question right now, that is only a provisional baptism, as Acts 19 shows, doesn't it? Well, Acts, Acts, 9, Acts 19 is, is a separate matter. Is, if, the, yeah. if, the, if the forgiveness of sins was efficacious, yeah. in other yes. words, the, the promised baptism actually delivered the forgiveness of sins upon sincere yeah. repentance, then that's that, that yep. at least prima facie seems to settle the whole forgiveness of sins yep. issue there and then yep. in Mark 1. Yep. Now, and therefore rendering any further drastic action on the part of God yep. uh, completely redundant and unnecessary, it would seem. Because yep. to say that it wasn't uh, uh, efficacious would seem right. to undermine the validity of John the Baptist's ministry in the first place. I mean, it, yep. it seems to be... It, a, it's a great question, uh, but I think that Paul answers you, though. Why does Paul, the apostle, rebaptize those people? There's something inadequate about the baptism of John. So it was good for the time. Well, what was inadequate about okay? What was inadequate about the baptism of John for, for Paul? Um, that's a very fascinating question. I, at the moment, all I can say is that Paul said it was inadequate, and he rebaptizes them. It's mm -hmm. only a baptism at that stage, but it is not ultimate baptism. It didn't even save them, did it? Why, if it saved them, so to speak, or got them on the road to salvation, why does Paul repeat it? They hadn't even heard about the Spirit, it says in Acts 19. Not that they hadn't heard there was a Holy Spirit. They hadn't heard about receiving the Spirit upon mm. repentance and baptism. So mm. he doesn't count that as a valid baptism. I think it's, I think it's a very interesting uh, question. I think it's he, adequate he for that point. But Paul yeah. doesn't count John the Baptist's a prophet of God, his baptism as valid? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that because otherwise, why would Paul rebaptize these people? But he can't say that, I mean, in, in the Jewish, in the, sorry, in the yep. Christian tradition and the Islamic tradition, John the Baptist is a real prophet of God. He's sent by God. No but question. All to declare his um, ministry to be invalid um, is, is what Muslims would call kufa. You, you, you yep. can't say that. Uh, you, yep. you know, if he's sent by God, he's sent by God. You, don't, you can't say he's not a real prophet or his, his ministry is at fault in a fundamental way. Otherwise, that's kufa. 
you, you've entered into yep. disbelief. I see that. Well, then Paul is an unbeliever. I'm not, I, I, I'm not talking about <laughs> on that Paul. argument. I, I'm not talking about Paul. I was just talking about John the Baptist. It, it, it just seems to me yeah. that Christians and Muslims all accept John the Baptist as a great prophet of God. Uh, I do. I uh, do. Of course, as, as, as I do. And that if his ministry was valid, uh, validly ex, um, explained in Mark 1, mm -hmm. <clears throat> if anyone else comes along and says, um, no, no, this was not valid, that that is kufa is unbelief it's yeah. not it's, it's not a valid position yeah. to hold yeah. if you are a person of god it, it is something that you yeah. one must right. run from kufa um, no i see i see that but i'm i'm trying i have to answer that because i think paul was speaking for jesus so all i can answer is this is a temporary thing it got them free of the sense of sin that's wonderful but it wasn't adequate because they didn't know about the spirit to be received at baptism apparently jesus was baptized by john too yes Absolutely. Okay. It's a great question. I don't think we've worked this out fully, but I have to defend Paul here. Paul did not consider that baptism of John to be adequate. Am I right? That, that may well be the case, but Paul, it, for, for me, uh, well, I'm not, it's not a question of what I believe right. about Paul uh, personally. Right. It's a question of how we uh, integrate these texts, if that's what we want to do, yeah. and bring yeah. them together. Are, are they uh, in tension or are they reconcilable? And so that's, yeah. that's what I'm inviting you to explain. Well, well, that's right. my, my own personal views about Paul are, are not really relevant and I'm not an expert. I just wanted to invite you okay. to explain how... Well, no, I'm so glad you did. My answer is clear. First of all, I accept Paul absolutely as speaking for Jesus. Yes. Secondly, I see the new covenant as being introduced on a progressive level. Because, for instance, Jesus cleansed all the foods in Mark 7. He abolished the food laws. I don't know that they fully understood that at that time, but they did gently. And then Jesus said, there are many things I can't even tell you now. Yes, in John, yeah. And what about the classic case where they say, do you, do you friends, <laughs> uh, they say to Jesus, do you guys pay the temple tax? Mm, mm, mm. And very cleverly, he says, we're sons of the kingdom. We're the royal family. Of course, we don't have to. But lest we offend them, let's do it. Yes. Paul is a huge diplomat. And so yes. the only answer, and you've helped me, by the way, by asking this question, because I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure this out more fully. But I have to insist that you can't say Paul apparently thought it was inadequate. He did, unless you don't believe Paul. Now, we maybe have differences on scripture here, but I, Paul... I, I, I personally, yeah, he he's not, he's not, Paul's not my uh, apostle, but I, 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 it's, okay. it, at the level of, of the text themselves, yes. it, there seems to be uh, a tension, shall we say. Um, no, uh, right. and, um, I see that. Uh, on, on, on just on a, on a related point um, yeah. about the law, uh, you know, you, you said that was it. Uh, you're quoting John, of course, the Gospel of John, that, uh, yes. that Moses brought the law, that Jesus, the Gospel, brings grace and truth. Absolutely. Um, it, it strikes me that uh, at least for one of the Gospel writers, for Matthew, that yep. in the kingdom of God itself, uh, yep. we can call it the king, call it the kingdom of heaven, but same thing. In the kingdom of God, uh, obedience to the law, the Jewish law, is still required. Uh, in fact, a renewed, intense obedience to the law the jewish law is required yep. uh, uh, it, it, after the you know in accordance with the interpretation of jesus with the absolutely the emphasis on certain principles like love yes. and i see and so on. yes uh, and, and obviously the famous passage in the sermon on the mount in matthew 5 don't think i've come to abolish the law but when he says therefore whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments of the law and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of yep. heaven um yep. but but that seems to sit in tension with the mark 7 passage you briefly alluded to where mm. if mark in parenthesis because not jesus who says this is a parenthetical comment in the bibles in other words it's in brackets says thus he declared all foods clean now jesus didn't say that by the way that was someone else whoever wrote the author well this remember this is scripture for me we're coming at this from two different angles that yeah. is scripture jesus yeah. in fact said don't you remember they broke the sabbath for goodness sake the priest working the temple could break the Sabbath. That, mm. that does away with Sabbath keeping right away. So I'm coming at this as a pure, simplistic biblicist. When Mark puts that thing, you say, well, Jesus didn't say that. Oh, that's scripture. Now you've really asked me to give up scripture, just so we understand where we're coming from. No, so he did what abolish was, the food. What I meant was that the, uh, uh, he declared all foods clean is not yeah. in, in, in Mark a statement of Jesus. It is a, a comment by the author of Mark, but it is scripture. You're absolutely right. But, but from my Mark, angle, it's scripture. That's of course all. It is. Of course yeah. it is. 
so it's just it seems to stand in some tension with this statement yeah. in Mark five on the very same subject, which is whoever, yeah. therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments mm -hmm. and the food laws, of course, maybe the kosher yeah. laws are not that small yeah. in Judaism, yeah. but the devil is one of the commandments and teaches others to do the same. Yeah. Yep. Um, will be called the very least in the kingdom of heaven. It struck me that Paul and others did say um, that that you didn't. He declared all foods clean, for example. Uh, Paul in Romans says that. He says it in Corinthians as well. He does. It doesn't matter what you eat, um, yeah. although uh, please don't offend others in your eating. That's Again, right. the diplomat, as you rightly called him, he's very yes. pastorally aware of the, yep. of, of the impact of this teaching. But nevertheless, for those in strong in faith, the implication is that you can eat pork totally but but th but again totally. th th this would seem to be in some considerable tension with matthew 5 where these precise laws are um required to, to be followed and whoever doesn't them doesn't do them will yeah. be called the very least in the kingdom now paul is yeah. not advocating least in the kingdom ethics he's advocating what he yeah. sees as normative ethics normative yeah. ethics yeah so there seems but, to be a, a tension yeah. there too what about me? And I love that word tension. It reminds me, I must just tell you that briefly, I had a conversation with F.F. F. Bruce, the late F.F. Yes. F. Bruce. Wow. He took a great interest in me, what, 40 years ago. Wow. I don't know why, but he was very kind. He wrote handwritten letters to me in yes. which he said, I, F.F. F. Bruce, don't think that Paul believed in pre-existence. I'm telling yeah. you that now, because I think Bruce would approve. <laughs> this is so interesting. Do you still have those letters? By F. I do. I do. These are these are belong in a in a in a, in a museum or public library. <laughs> they, they know that because so right. these are very precious. Yeah. He's a great they are very precious. He he was a very conscious man, the star of the Plymouth Brethren. Yeah. His eschatology is ours. I say, we are futurists, not pre-trib rapture. That's complete <laughs> nonsense. But yes, there's a future seventieth week for us, and there was for Bruce. Bruce is a precious guy, and Lad. We knew Lad also, George Lad. So we met the top people. I didn't plan that, but got, but my dad, as I told you, my dad said, go to the top people. F.F. Bruce, if you're going to contradict oh, F.F. Bruce, he, you're he, going to have a good reason. He's you know. Professor of Political Criticism at Manchester University, and G.B. Laird was, was Professor at Oxford. Yes. His book on language imagery of, of the Bible yes. was, was uh, hugely, I, I just loved that book. It was just good. sheer joy to read that. The, the, um, yes. And of course, he, uh, Tom Wright, we won't get into eschatology, but Tom Wright, I yeah. think, got his what are to my mind rather unpersuasive ideas about um, Mark 13 and Matthew 24 and eschatology and the second coming. I'm glad to hear you say uh, that unpersuasive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the poor guy's uh, too British. Come on, get a life book, good man. Oh, the <laughs> kingdom these ideas from, from his teacher, GB Caird. I'm thinking, yes. that's the source of the rot here. <laughs> well, anyway. probably is, yes. Anyway, it's another subject. Yes. But that's I do think, though, you didn't tell us as clearly as what you said when you spoke of Matthew there. You didn't say, Jesus also said, I came to fulfill the law. Listen to the antithesis. The law said this, and I'm saying something opposite. Didn't he? Uh, You've heard that it was said. Can you show, give me an example of an opposite in, in those antithesis? You've heard that it was said, but I say unto you. You've heard that it was said that Moses said you could have a divorce for whatever that reason was in Deuteronomy 20. But I'm yeah. contradicting Moses. Come on. Yeah. Isn't he? Yes. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm not denying that. But, I but know the, you're not. But the, the other one not. about uh, hatred and murder and yeah. adultery and lust are not opposites. He's, he's radically no. interiorizing them. He's intensifying it. Going, uh, uh, going uh, higher. Uh, he's going higher, as you say. The, yeah. the, the example you gave, though, is an example of uh, where he's, he's giving a new, uh, you know, uh, he's stressing some scriptural principles, Genesis, arguably yes. against others in De Deuteronomy. But I love uh, it. I love it. See, this is my life because I was for 14 years a Sabbath keeper. Mm. I've done the cult thing, Paul, if I yeah. may put it to you this way. I've yeah. done the cult thing. I know what the Watchtower is like. I have many friends in the Watchtower and ex-Watchtower people, and it's terrifying for them because their husbands maybe are still in or the wives still in. It's a terrible thing. Why is it, sorry, it's a change subject. I don't care. Why is it, why is it terrifying? I, I just don't, I mean, seriously, I don't know why. Well, why because the control of the Watchtower is right. alarming. Right. Right. If the Watchtower said that Jesus came back in 1914, then he must have. I've right. done the cult thing. I was in the grip of Herbert W. Armstrong, I had no qualifications. And he said, Anthony, have you read the Ten Commandments? I didn't know where they were. Mm. I looked them up. Guess what the fourth one says? It says rest on Saturday. So I did it. I, God put, I, I've been through the training. Yeah. And I think I learned some things. I'm absolutely against control of that sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And especially, now I'll be the real snob. I'll be the real snob especially the amateur 
who has no right to tell you about any Greek word. I know something about language. I know very little about history, geography, hopeless, mathematics, terribly bad. I have some sense of language because we at our school were told to do German when we were 13. You know, we specialize, as you know, in the British system, very young. I'm thankful for that. Mm. I now understand the Ten Commandments were for Moses under the law. So we keep saying, to build this into our vocabulary, the law of Moses in the letter, finished. Mm -hmm. The law of Messiah, the Torah of Messiah and the Spirit, everything. Mm -hmm. We don't but, understand that well. Many do not. Just uh, This is not a pedantic point, because I, I generally <laughs> don't know the answer to this question. Right, when right. Jesus in, in in Matthew 5, 17, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come to not come fulfill to fulfill it, to fulfill. Yes. What does fulfill mean? Yes. Now Bring it to the high level. I, I'm not asking a simplistic lexicographical question here. I mean, in this context, what is he what does he mean by fulfillment? What's going well, on? Well, he explains it. He said, You've heard that hate, you know, is a bad thing, or the killing is a bad thing. We're going up. It's like in music, music is the other part of my life. A music you modulate when you really want to get excited at the end of a tune you go up a key right <laughs> and everybody gets lifted that's exactly what he's doing there everything is in that word fulfill he describes it you've heard that we said it's wrong to kill let me go higher now let me fulfill that and take it to a higher notch so if you haven't got the distinction and you i'm sure you have many do not between the old covenant in the letter and the new covenant in the spirit you haven't really got the calendar right at all the timetable. I, I, that's my basic point. Yes, I, I think I think that's interesting. Okay, the, your, your point about the uh, uh, your musical analogy is yep. uh, uh, lovely. I've not heard that before, and um, good. I actually understand what you mean, and that is helpful. Good. Thank you. I, I'll, I'll keep that in my I mind. So. Um, Lots of books on there, but I, I, I yeah. did go to school at Bethany. Don't forget, I went to school at Bethany Theological Seminary and in, in got my masters there. Yes. Uh, way back and you know after coming to america and they were very good on this stuff they didn't yeah. care about my non-trinitarianism they said you go to the, uh, the library and study your stuff and i i was talking to james dunn by letter at that point so they were very pleased with me but mm -hmm. they were very good on the on the seven <laughs> on the mount i loved that too i i, I just just finally then yeah. I, I, just picking your, your brains it, yeah. it, it, it struck me that in the earliest church this is after the ascension of yes. Jesus that we, um, the church centered in Jerusalem seemed to be headed by James. Amen. Uh, uh, for, uh, according to Josephus, uh, as you know, uh, yep. for some considerable time, and there are other uh, historical reminiscences of his great prominence in yes. early Jewish Christianity. Yes. Um, and, and what I find interesting and distinctive about James is precisely that he was a Jewish Christian who was famed according to some sources, for his, his Torah observance. Absolutely. Uh, and um, whether or not he saw his own brother Jesus as God, of course, is an interesting question. Uh, I can answer that one flat out now. No. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine? Oh, he's no. my brother. No, he, no. He's Yahweh. Sorry. I, I just... Oh, no. No, I, I love the humor because that's the absurdity of the whole thing. It, yeah. is, slightly, it is slightly absurd. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and people don't seem to realize that he had a brother even. Um, but anyway, no. it, perhaps he had several brothers and sisters even. Yes. But um, as, as you know, but the point is, he, he, he uh, is very proud of, of all these in the council uh, yes. in Acts. Yes. He's uh, proud that these Pharisees who are zealous for the law, how they have Absolutely. the kingdom and um, which is interesting. And yeah. it, it strikes me and it's not just something I've noticed other people like Jimmy Dunn and others of course. voluminously about this. Absolutely. Is, is that there was, again, this if I use this perhaps euphemism tension. Um, yeah. Between a more Jewish uh, understanding of the Jesus movement yes. in the earliest days, of course, I'm not talking about yes. the second century or anything. That's they, right. They're a very different story, and and a more Hellenistic kind of um, yep. Pauline um, faith, Absolutely. which see uh, represented uh, in other works. So, uh, and particularly around, it's not just about admission of the Gentiles on what conditions. I mean, that, that was one of the, the mm. issues I know. Mm. But also mm. about the nature. It's, it strikes me that Jesus wasn't find, founding a new religion in no. that sense. Totally. He was, it was a renewal movement within Judaism. Yep. It was a Jewish faith in yep. the Messiah who had yep. come and died and risen. As you, as Absolutely. You um, but that strikes me as quite a different faith from virtually all Christians today, who, for whom Torah observance seems to have fallen by the wayside completely um, yep. in the Catholic Church, the Church of England, the Methodists and 
a whole all, all the major denominations uh, in America and, and here. And it just strikes me as very peculiar that that even though people have this allegiance to Jesus uh, and the apostles who they revere, mm. they're not actually. Uh, it's not just on Christology, by the way. It, it's also on the place of the law. And it struck me that Jesus was a Torah observant Jew, albeit with some um, amendments to the divorce law, as you say. But the, the great bulk of it is still followed. It's not. He's he's not antinomian. He's not saying, "Well, don't follow the law anymore." No. Uh, but but Paul, uh, particularly in places like Ephesians two fifteen, says, yeah. "Well." Uh, he has abolished the law uh, yeah. with its commandments and its regulations yeah. in direct antithesis to that. And, and the antithesis to what it says in James, where he talks about the royal law that brings yeah. liberty, etc. I mean, you, you get the idea, I'm sure. No, I do. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, it strikes me that we're, we're dealing with attention. Again, this euphemism to some yeah. extent. Uh, uh, yeah, done, yeah. It, done in one place causes a schism, actually, between yes. the more Jewish yeah. Christianity and the more Hellenistic yeah. wing. And this is right at the beginning. This is not later uh, yeah. in the uh, and 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 this you see reflected even in the new testament itself uh, we mm -hmm. mentioned the, the council uh, in acts we see mm -hmm. uh, uh, matthew's teaching of, about jesus and the law yeah uh, and paul's teaching as well and i just want to get you, you, yeah. your reflections on well this. i mean this is what we think about all day long and here's what we've come to there is tension and i didn't quite finish my story with ff bruce i phoned him in scotland oh, yeah. way back and I said, what about 1 Corinthians 15, where the resurrection produces eternal life? Yes. And 2 Corinthians 5, where it's apparently the opposite. Yes. And he said, yes, I do see the tension, Mr. Buzzard. <laughs> so look out for theology Mr. speak. Did he call you Mr. Buzzard? Shameful. Yeah, no, right. Uh, <laughs> you know, Americans like, if you want it, you know, of interest. But anyway, Bruce said, I do see the tension. But may I say that a lot of academic theology is waffle land. <laughs> Talk about give with one hand and take away with the other. What does the public make of this? I mean, your friend, uh, the bishop, you know, the famous bishop, Tom Wright, he doesn't see the kingdom. Come on, Tom. You don't see the reality of the messianic kingdom. Let's quote Calvin, Acts 1.6, you know it. Is this the time to restore the kingdom? And Calvin said, do you know what he said? No, please. You're going to love this. Calvin said there are more errors in that question than there are words. <laughs> I'm glad really? you're not approving Calvin. Watch out for uh, Calvin. Uh, he uh, murdered uh, us. He would have Calvin. murdered me. <laughs> well, yeah, well, yes, he had a, a bit of a track record um, in that. Yes. Um, yeah, that's somebody our whole said problem. in his commentary on uh, Acts, really, yeah. gosh. Uh, uh, more errors. For me, that's the most exciting question. That's, I would have been on the front row, the front seat saying, <laughs> OK. Because the kingdom, I want to tell you, Paul, and you don't need to be told, is everything for us. Not just that you're going to be there and hold uh, the door for a thousand years. Hmm. Pretty boring. You might as well play a harp on a pink cloud and do nothing. You, Paul, and Jesus are going to fix the world. Hmm. And this is so relevant to America. All they talk about on Fox News and every news is who's going to govern. Mm. Who's going to govern? The, I want to tell you, the Bible story is who is going to be in charge of the world Jesus is, using you and your talents and your training to fix the world. And my goodness, it needs to be fixed. That is your kingdom come. Very mm. Jewish, totally Jewish. But isn't that wonderful, though? Mm -hmm. is it, is, how could you be more excited than about God using your God-given talents? And I said to the students year after year, what talent have you got that God didn't give you? None. Your job is to do with your talents what you can for the gospel. Mm -hmm. And then I will put you in charge of five cities, ten cities. Well done. Well done, you good and faithful sir. What? Poor little me, I'm nothing. Wait a minute. Where do those talents come from? Well done. You're done good. That's Georgian. You're done good. And now take charge of five cities and solve this mess. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of Christianity, namely the gospel of the kingdom. That's where we're coming from. Oh, that's marvelous. Did just a final question. Our point about the gospel I, I, kingdom. I, thank you. Yes, I think I'm in time. Did you, uh, are you um, planning to write any further uh, books? Uh, I don't think so. I'm 85 now. I've written seven or eight. I, oh, uh, the kingdom is my passion. Mm -hmm. I did two books on the Trinity. I don't know how I got into that, except as JT was doing it all, Caird was doing it all, mm -hmm. and the Christadelphians were coming at me. And then the Christadelphians said to me, by the way, you're the devil, Anthony. There's no devil. <laughs> I started thinking about that. And then recently I was invited to debate somebody called Burke on that question. And that I want to tell you is a prodigious falsehood. 
that the devil is a yatsar hara, yatsar hara, the internal inclination to do evil. That's oh, not that, the devil. No, indeed. No, you're smiling, but there are thousands of Christadelphians out there with the same sort of passion. Well, you, and you, you say that, but in the Church of England, there are plenty of uh, theologians and uh, bishops who uh, doubt the existence of a uh, devil as well, and even modernist Muslims, for some of them. But anyway, that's a different subject. But. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm frankly uh, totally stunned to hear of your age, so Anthony. You, okay. have, you have the enthusiasm and the energy of a, someone <laughs> half your age. At the very least, and, uh, it's in the gene. Do you look at yes. your parents? You say, yes. look, what was what drove dad? He had a way of putting his finger on the issue. Right. The problem, people get lost in a million details. You yeah. know, John 1, 1, it couldn't be in the beginning was God and God spoke to God. That's two gods, end of story. So, you know, we say what John Biddle said, you know about John Biddle, I'm sure. Oh, the great Unitarian. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If Jesus died, he couldn't be God. End of story. Shut up, <laughs> sit down and get on with life. Uh, have I, a life. I, I have argued that point many times. Uh, but the, what, <laughs> what they say is, oh, his, hum his humanity died. And they're thinking, hang on, that's a human sacrifice, I'm afraid. If you believe a, a human being died, yes. sacrifice, that's called a, well, that, I don't want to tread on that issue. But uh, no, I, that's I, good. I, Absolutely. Uh, I will end it here because I, do, I, I feel I could, this has been so enjoyable. Yeah. Are, are you coming? Are, do you have any plans to come to the... Not UK? really. My parents, of course, are long dead. Dad died at 69. The war killed him. You know, he was holding somebody up in the North Sea when his ship, uh, Gurkha, HMS Gurkha, was sunk. Wow. And they gave him a DSO for that, Distinguished Service Order. But that must have taken out of him. My mother died in 84 or so, I mean, when she was about 84. Yeah. No, and, and let me put in my plug for diet here. In England, yes, my British brethren, we were told that w the idea that what you eat affects your health is a stupid American thing. Actually, it isn't. Not anymore, it's not. Not anymore. No, got it. Thank you. You're exactly right. Not for a right. long In, time. Not for a long I'm time. I'm talking a long time. I'm talking about yeah, the 50s, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. started on this Kingdom of God lark. I find you, by the way, so exciting. I'll go upstairs and I'll say to Barbara, where do you find people like this? It's, you're, you're it's just a joy. You're, you're uh, 55, 1955 Armstrong said the kingdom. Yeah. 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 Well, good. I don't know what is more exciting because the world is so tragic at the border. Have you seen what's happening at the border right now mm. in uh, America? Which were you mean, the, Me the Mexican border or? Sorry. Yeah, the Mexican border. You've got right. children of three and four wandering up there by themselves. We need Jesus here to sit in Jerusalem on the throne of David and mm. let's get this sorted out. And let's use Paul and all of his experience and talent mm. through much tribulation we enter the kingdom. Mm -hmm. That's the whole thing to me, it's simple. But my goodness, a lot of work to do. So I'm, I'm thrilled with your work. I, I can't believe how we crossed paths, but I'm so glad we did. Oh, I, I'm, I, I'm just, uh, your enthusiasm is infectious, <laughs> I must say, and I hope it inspires <laughs> others to the good works uh, as well. Um, good. We'll leave it there because uh, otherwise yeah, uh, but I, absolutely. I, I, I do uh, very grateful and uh, in, enjoyable uh, meeting with I'm you. I'm grateful to you indeed. I don't know fully whether you are a Muslim or a Christian. I, that's up to you. That's fine. Maybe you're not declaring that publicly and that, that's fine too. But we'll, you know, we can pursue that. Uh, I'm, I'm like you. I'm passionate for the truth. Um, and so I love it. That, that's what counts. I love it. Well, thank you. Carlos, is there anything you wanted to say in yeah. conclusion? Uh, uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you yeah. for your time and your invitation. And uh, thank you. we might speak again. Thank you. Yeah, we'd love it. Thank so, you, thank Paul. You, Take care. Pleasure meeting you. Take Goodbye. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.